ITRP expert uh, series, and today we will have a, a very great webinar uh, entitled Evolving Critical Systems with a very great speaker, Professor Mike Inche. Uh, and uh, let me talk a bit uh, a short about uh, him. Uh, Professor Mike uh, is um, Professor Mike is. Um, uh, Okay, Professor Mike is affiliated with the uh, Irish Software Research Center, and uh, he is uh, a great uh, volunteer in ITRP Computer Society and uh, one of the candidates in the Board of Governors at the ITRP Computer Society this year. And uh, you can vote him. him. And uh, as I remember, he is also the Vice President for the International Federation of Information Processing. And uh, he has a very uh, great background. And uh, I think uh, Professor Mike uh, can introduce uh, himself better than me. Uh, welcome to Professor Mike, to our webinar. Uh, thank you, Omar. Thank you for the, the very nice uh, introduction. Um, I'm very glad to join you today. It's very kind of you to invite me. Ah, there is some problem with the sharing for some reason. Oh, I see what's happened. It's given me twice. I am sorry about this. I was trying to be. But, uh... Apologies. There we go. My apologies for that. Uh, thank you, Omar, for the very nice introduction. It's very good to be with you today, and thank you for the invitation. As Omar said, my name is Mike Hinchy. I am actually the former director of Lero, which is the Irish Software Research Center. We actually have uh, rebranded since last week, so we have a slightly different logo and a slightly different name, but it's still Lero. And uh, this is probably the last talk I get to give with the old uh, logo, so thank you for that opportunity. I like to remind people just how young our discipline is. People tend to forget that we don't have the long history of mathematics or physics and chemistry, the natural sciences, which of course we didn't create, were there to begin with. So I remind people of just where we came from. So this is the state of the art in 1949. This is a machine built at the University of Cambridge called EDZAC. It's not the first computer, it's not even the first electronic computer, but it is the first computer that could execute a stored program. And that was a complete game changer in software because it meant now that programs were no longer static. Programs were no longer predefined steps. The program could change as it executed. And that gave us a whole new opportunity in developing new classes of software that we could never have done had we not had this. So again, dates back to 1949. So we're still a relatively young discipline. I was very lucky to do my PhD at the University of Cambridge and I knew some of the people who had worked on this. They were still alive at that point. Unfortunately, all have passed away at this stage. But just to give you an idea of what that machine was like, it was 650 instructions per second 1,024 17-bit words of memory, uh, paper tape input and output, 3,000 valves comprising 12 kilowatts of power consumption. And it took up a room of about five meters by four meters, and it needed about four times that space around it just for ventilation. Um, it was originally intended to be used really for scientific purposes. And in 1951, the British government did a survey, and they determined that they would only ever need three of these machines for the entire country. Now, if you have a smartphone in your pocket, you have far more power than three of these machines in your pocket or on the desk next to you. In fact, it wasn't until 1958 that it was first thought of using this for a business purpose. And in fact, IEEE are hoping to unveil a milestone plaque to commemorate the 1958 
first use of a computer in business. And it was the Lions Tea Company that were uh, using it to control the inventory of the tea that they were importing from India and what is now Sri Lanka. Many people consider this to be the first computer or the first real computer, although, of course, there were devices for calculations far earlier than this. This was the difference engine and, and subsequently the analytical engine built in, designed and partially built, I should say, by Charles Babbage, the gentleman on the bottom right. Uh, just to give you an idea of how big the portions that he built are, on the top left, you see a gentleman named Doran Swade, who is the former curator of the Science Museum in London, and he's roughly six foot four tall. That gives you an idea of how big the pieces of this machine were. I actually got to borrow part of this machine back in the early 90s when we had the conference in Cambridge on the 45th anniversary of the first time that EDZAC ran. And it is thought that had Babbage had access to the fabrication possibilities that we have nowadays, he would have been able to make the cogs and wheels accurate enough that the machine that he designed, and as I say, partly built, would have worked completely, and he would have been able to build it completely. So many people... Like, uh, excuse me, uh, it seems that uh, the slide is, uh, you know, there may be a problem about the slide or uh, because I couldn't see the slide is changing. Okay, let me stop sharing and try sharing again and hope that works. Okay, for some reason, it is separating out the screen presentation from the um, PowerPoint presentation. I don't understand why. And the PowerPoint presentation is not going into display mode. I've never had this problem before, so I don't know what's causing it. As I remember, we, may, uh, we experienced uh, some, uh, a similar thing in uh, one of the previous webinars. That is why uh, I want to remind it. Or uh, As I see, uh, the fourth uh, page was the last page I, I can see, uh, fourth page of this, uh, webinar, um, this slide. Uh, is it right? Or? Can you see, yes. Can you see a difference engine? There's three photographs across the screen and a slide four on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you uh, see that? Okay. No, no, I, I, I cannot see the uh, I cannot see the PowerPoint now. Could you share it? I'm sharing it. I don't know why it's not showing. This is very strange. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Like I said, I've never had this problem before. So, try. Now, can you see a slide? Can you see a slide? It says it's screen sharing and participants can now see your application. Can you see the slide changing? Yeah, uh, we can see, okay, we can see state of art now. Okay, can you now see the difference engine? Yeah, the difference engine now. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, and now slide five. Okay, I think we're working there. Good. The situation, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, sorry about that, folks. And um, as they say, anyone can make a mistake, but to really mess things up, you need a computer. <laughs> anyway, um, many people think that Babbage set out to build a computer, but that's not actually what he did. What he did was set out to solve a very specific problem. And here is the problem. It is errors in the logarithmic tables that were used in the shipping industry. So you see here a correction of the logarithmic tables in 1832, a correction of the correction in 1833, and a correction of the correction of the correction in 1836. So these tables were notoriously inaccurate. The result was that ships were lost at sea, cargo was lost, lives were lost, money was lost. It truly was a safety critical application. So Babbage had the idea 
that if he could automate the, the generation of these logarithmic tables, he would be able to solve that problem. And in fact, he even had an idea whereby he would be able to use cogs and wheels that had numbers in reverse that he could press these against paper, scatter ink across it, and that that would make, um, would it result in printing the tables automatically. So the principle is actually not terribly different from what we do with the laser printer nowadays, except of course, we use a laser rather than um, cogs and wheels. But many of the ideas Babbage came up with, with having main memory and backing memory and cache memory are still things that we use in computing these days. So along with the first computer came the first computer programmer. She was Augusta Ada Byron, the daughter of Lord Byron, poet. She married Lord King, and he eventually became the Earl of Lovelace. So we know her as Ada Lovelace. And she was very interested in Babbage's machine, unusual for someone, for a lady at that time. And she felt that she could use it to solve other problems and do more things than just computing logarithmic tables. So she did. And she solved numbers of, a number of problems. And she wrote out how she did these on pieces of paper. And she swapped the pieces of paper around in different orderings to do different things. So essentially, she had the early idea of, of software reuse. Nowadays, of course, we're used to software in just about everything, any form of transportation, from cars, buses, and trains to planes, even bicycles and scooters nowadays in many cities around the world are, are tracked with GPS, we can rent them with apps, etc. I have a colleague who's obsessed with getting rid of traffic lights. And in fact, I live 217 kilometers from Dublin Airport, and there's one set of traffic lights between my house and the airport, which I'm dying to get rid of. I read a recent report of an experiment in England whereby they had traffic lights send signals to cars so that the cars would know to slow down to avoid a red light. And this actually reduced emissions in the cars by 67%. So it's something that's really, really interesting. And of course we have ambitions to go back to space and we are doing that right now, but we have ambitions for greater things. This is the project that was originally called Constellation, then Orion, then Artemis, then Constellation again, and now it's back to Artemis, so to the moon, and then ultimately back to Mars uh, to bring humans to Mars. We've seen, of course, dramatic pictures coming back from Mars as a result of the new rover and the new uh, heli helicopter that are on Mars. And of course, multiple nations now have missions to Mars, India, China, UAE, USA, et cetera. So going to Mars is something that we've really built a great industry around and great excitement around. Of course, we already have industry 4.0 upon us and people are talking about industry 5.0 already. We've seen how we use software and technology and energy generation in telecommunications. And unfortunately in the last 18 months or so, we've seen how important software and uh, IT has become to treating patients identifying patients and tracking patients. In many cases, that's with a simple device that again, many of you have in your pocket or on the desk next to you. We've seen how important it has become to rely on technology and IT for simple things like learning. Uh, our school systems, our university systems, our education systems would have died completely in the last 18 months if we didn't have some form of e-learning or technology like Zoom. We've seen how we use it for financial transactions, how we rely on it for shopping, getting food delivered, uh, et cetera. And of course, with that comes the opportunity for misuse, whereby people can be exploited, whereby uh, people can be physically robbed, or, or virtually robbed, I should say, uh, where money can be taken from their accounts because they give out information about themselves. You may recall in the middle of last summer, there were hacks on Twitter into the accounts of well-known politicians and well-known actors and actresses claiming that if you send $1,000 in Bitcoin, you get $2,000 sent back. This is a posting from Barack Obama's account. It's not a fake post. It was actually posted from his account, just that his account was hacked. Now, of course, there were some people who would have fallen for this and believed it to be true, but we would hope that most of the people who were naive enough to believe this did not have enough knowledge about Bitcoin to be able to send it. So we're truly now in what I like to call a cyber physical, cyber physical social system. It's cyber because it's reliant on software. It's physical because it connects to devices, whether 
the devices that we wear, such as Fitbits or watches, whether it's uh, devices like that are built into our cars, our intelligent highways, are in various places around the city, all of which are interconnected and talking to each other. And of course, as a social system, we're giving it to our friends on social media, but we're also giving it to app providers in various ways. They give us the app often for free. That app gives us some useful technology, some useful convenience. And as a result, we give them the right to use our data, which they monetize in various other ways to sell us things uh, physical things or services that we may want or may not want. So one of my colleagues, Brian Fitzgerald, did a survey a number of years ago with the University of Cambridge on just who writes software and who needs software in their various industries. Well, obviously, you see it's essential in the software industry and even in the hardware industry, but it's necessary for food production, for pharmaceuticals, for financial services, medical devices telecommunications, all sorts of transport, energy generation and distribution, all sorts of business services, as we've seen over the last 18 months, including consumer and retail, and of course, media and entertainment and the technology like we're using today to have meetings and communications. So software is the leading edge in just about everything. It's the main component in cloud computing, data analytics and big data, in cyber physical social systems, as I described, in multi-core and in smart anything, whether it's smart energy, smart cars, smart buildings, smart cities, all of it is dependent on software. So software is the main source of innovation in ICT itself, but also in medical technologies and financial services, in manufacturing and even automotive. So here's a chart that it, uh, it comes from the BMW group, the car manufacturer. It might be a little bit confusing because it uses two different scales, but what it says is that around about 2013, BMW became essentially a software company because it had more software engineers than any other sort of engineer. And BMW claimed that they make on average 2.3 of any one car because the cars are so customized, not just in physical terms like colors and uh, seating options, et cetera. But with the software, the cars are so customized that they don't make many cars that are identical. At the top of the screen, there's a quote from Analog Devices, uh, the vice president of research. Uh, Analog Devices are a major employer in the city where I'm based, Limerick. Um, and they are the second or third largest chip manufacturer in the world. And he, here's what the vice president of research says. He says, our company has become a software company. The trouble is our engineers don't realize it yet. So the problem is writing good quality software. Software coding can be as little as 7% of the entire investment in the project. So the problem is that we're trying to do a lot more things, a lot larger systems, and our systems are completely interconnected, not just intentionally interconnected, but also interconnected because users are using various apps and devices that also talk to each other. And there is a direct correlation between how good we are at building software and the benefits to our business, whether it's time to market, the quality of our product, our productivity, our meeting requirements for regulation. And when it goes wrong, software mistakes are huge. So the Toyota braking glitch uh, is estimated to have cost about three billion US dollars in terms of recalls. The Mars Orbiter uh, is estimated to have cost about 655 million. Software is very different from hardware. Software is there everywhere, but we don't realize it. I mean, how many people realize how much software there is in their dishwasher or their washing machine? It's also something that's abstract. We can't touch it, we can't see it. Therefore, we don't realize it's there. And people think that it's easy to change it. Indeed, it is. But the problem is that because we think it's easy to change it, we often change it, and we often change it badly. And the quality of our software degrades as we change it. And we don't see that it's deteriorating. If we have a bridge that's rusting, we can see it. If we have a car that's rusting, we can see it. But we can't see that our software is deteriorating as it does over time as we make changes to it. And of course, there's been a number of famous examples of software failing. Direct 25 is an example where interlocks that were based on hardware were converted to software. The people operating the machine, which was used for radiation therapy, were able to change the settings 
and get around the interlocks. And as a result, a large number of women were killed when they got overdoses of radiation for breast cancer. Ariane 5 is a famous example of the European Space Agency uh, converting software from Ariane 4 to Ariane 5, a module that was not needed, that was intended to keep Ariane 4 on the launch pad at the launch time and reduce jitter, was transferred over to, into Ariane 5, was not appropriate to be used, and basically pulled the rocket off its launch, off its path, and it exploded after about seven seconds. And the Mars Polar Lander is a famous example of a NASA failure where a, a, a uninitialized variable caused jitter in the landing gear to give the impression to the lander that it was far from the planet's surface and that it sped up. And instead of what it should have done was realized that it was coming close to the planet's surface and reverse thrust and come down slowly. At least that's what's thought to have happened because there was nobody there to actually see it. And there are many more examples of software failures. You could go on and on for days about them. And the problem is, of course, that when we have software failures, we tend to have huge losses in financial terms, losses in terms of technology opportunities lost, and in many cases, loss of life. So as Bill Gates says, the problem is complexity. It is indeed, the problem is that we're actually doing, trying to do rather too much. Uh, and sometimes we're trying to do things that we really don't need and we're making things complex when we don't need to. This is a, a chart from a paper by Ebert and Jones in IEEE Computer Magazine back in April, 2009. So it's quite out of date. But even back then you can see the amount of code that was in all sorts of devices from uh, washing machines and low cost mobile phones up to high end mobile phones. And remember, this is prior to the iPhone. So by a high end mobile phone, we're talking about something that could do text messaging. So see how much software was involved in that, even as it were. And from the same article, we see the increase in the amount of software in various industries. So the red diamonds are spaceflight control. So as you can imagine, spaceflight control uh, grew dramatically from the 1960s in the Apollo missions all the way up to the space shuttle in the 1990s and 2000s. Switching systems here uh, are the blue squares that represents, of course, the internet and the growth of the internet. The yellow squares are the Linux kernel, and you see that growing very rapidly in the 90s because, of course, it was an open source project. And the green triangles are automotive embedded software, which, again, in the early 1990s, there was virtually no software in cars. Nowadays, there are many of the high end cars that have 70 plus processors, all running software, all talking to each other over Canvas. So cars are intensely uh, reliant on software these days. So we're in a situation that we're, we have grew greater demand for more and more complex functionality. We want greater performance. We have stricter constraints on that performance. Some of, it, some of it is because we're not prepared to wait. We want to increase our productivity and reduce our costs. And we constantly want our software to be updated and to evolve. So as Albert Einstein said, any intelligent tool can make things bigger and more complex, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And in many ways, that's what we have to do. So software isn't static. Uh, we have legacy systems that result in systems being combined together because of acquisitions or mergers. We have new software technologies that we want to exploit, whether it's cloud computing or something else. We have users have requirements for compliance with regulations in various industries. But we also have software that changes at runtime. And it changes at runtime because we need to react to something that has happened in the environment that we perhaps didn't know about and we hadn't planned for. And in many cases, these are threats, threats to the existence of the software, threats to the running of the software, and threats to the organization. As my friend Sean Bonner says, software is supposed to change. If it didn't change, we'd do it in the hardware. The big advantage of software is that we can make change easily. So my background is space exploration. Think of trying to bring down satellites to update software. We don't need to do that anymore. We can send software up there. Clearly we can't change lenses or cameras. 
remotely, but we can do, we can certainly send up new functionality in the form of software. And I'll talk about that later. Think of also a pacemaker where in the past patients had to undergo surgery every few years to have the pacemaker updated. Nowadays, they can have software updates even remotely. They don't even have to go to the hospital to have it updated. You may recall um, a number of years ago when the vice president of the US, Dick Cheney, had a pacemaker, there were concerns that he could be assassinated by people trying to hack into his pacemaker and change its operation. So of course, the advantage of being able to change software means that we have to be cautious about how it's changed and who can change it. So cybersecurity becomes a large issue. And we're concerned with critical applications. More and more software is being used in critical applications. So critical in the past had meant that if it failed, we'd damage property or the environment. But it also comes to mean security critical. So we might give away information about people or about organizations. Um, and nowadays it's becoming more about being business critical. The fact is that the software is critical to how the business runs. If the software fails, the business isn't able to operate. Think of Amazon if they couldn't sell things for multiple days. Um, and what happens to their loss of competitive advantage? You go to the last place you bought something and were happy with. If you can't go to someone and buy from them because their software has failed, you'll go somewhere else. And then the next time you'll probably also go to that somewhere else. So software is essential to our business, to our product base, and to ensuring that we've competitive advantage over other people in similar industry. So we're in a situation that we have lots of software, it's everywhere, it's widely used, and it's often invisible to us. We don't know it's even there. We have a lot of bad code that has evolved over long periods of time. The oldest known running software is owned by NASA. It's the Voyager 2 software. It's more than 50 years old. Uh, Voyager 2 went into Stellar a few years ago. We believe it's still running, even though there's no communication with it. That is the oldest running software. Naturally, it's been updated many times over the years. We've already talked about a number of software failures and declining quality. The problem is that we don't have enough qualified developers and testers. And the things that we've been doing in our industry for the last 50 years are not sufficient anymore. So we have software systems that have evolved from legacy code or legacy systems over long periods of time and been combined and changed. We have a combination of existing components over significant periods of time. We have software that evolves as intentional change. So we've decided to exploit the internet or cloud computing or to use new techniques that we think are going to be better and give us better results. And then my own area, we have software that adapts and evolves at runtime, often changing itself and making changes by itself so that we can protect it, ensure that it runs in the long term, and that it gives us the performance and functionality that we wanted, even if we didn't previously know what that might be. So we've devised this evolving critical systems research area, and we've just set down a number of principles for how software systems need to be built. The idea is that software has to be described in a manner that enables developers to understand the full functionality of the system. And on these slides, you'll see in italics, the sub areas of software engineering that come into play. We need to express in a clear and precise way what we want our system to do. And we want to be flexible enough that we can fit with the processes and practices of the organization that is developing the software or maintaining the software indeed. This is a chart from the NASA controller. Um, I spent 15 years as director of the NASA Software Engineering Lab, so that's why a lot of my examples are NASA-based. Uh, this is a chart of various NASA missions. The names of the missions are not confidential, just they're taken off so that you can actually read the slide. The red dot nearest to the center is the Hubble Space Telescope. And what this says is that when NASA invests about 2% of its project costs in uh, requirements, it has a 200% cost overrun. If it invests about 15% in requirements, it has about a 10% cost overrun. So the argument is fairly obvious. Now this curve, I think, is actually the right shape, but it should be up and to the right because NASA missions 
traditionally have run way more than 200% over budget. The Artemis mission that I showed you on a slide a while back, at the time it was conceived around the end of the 1990s, was to be the largest software project in history at 8 billion US dollars for the software alone. That is billion, not million. And that was the software alone. That was not the hardware, that was not the science, that was not the experiment, that was not the equipment, only software. So if you're talking about $8 billion for software, can you possibly afford a 200% cost overrun or potentially more? So we need to describe the architecture of our systems in a way that it's well understood because this architecture is going to be the basis of many of the changes that we're going to make as our software evolves. And this is particularly true when we're talking about systems that evolve at runtime, whether you call that self-managing software, adaptive systems, autonomic computing, organic computing, whatever is your favorite term. They all have the same principle that they're going to evolve at runtime and architectural decisions have to be made. And of course we want models of a system because models will change over time and give us information about the system and will be the basis of our code generation. And ideally we'd like that to be automated code generation. So we have to structure systems in a way that's clear and controlled with certain core functionality that will never change. And then we can add features, adapt features, even delete features as necessary as the software evolves over time. So we need to make sure that the quality and the reliability of our system is not impaired over time. We want to make sure that we're constantly reviewing and overviewing the development and the evolution. We want to make sure that we meet all the policies and constraints of our organization and our regulatory bodies. And we want to collect data and evidence, various metrics, et cetera, to demonstrate that we are keeping the reliability of the system, that we're not losing reliability over time. And in fact, that our reliability even improves over time because of the changes we make to our software. So that's why we've defined this evolving critical systems research agenda. The intention is to build software that's highly reliable from the beginning. And then as it evolves over time, we maintain that reliability or even improve that reliability without incurring prohibitive costs. So that's not to say that there is no cost, but without prohibitive costs. So here are just a few of the things that we do in our center. And of course, this changes over time with different emphasis. But we've been working on smart cities, working with uh, companies like Intel and IBM and Dublin City Council, which is the capital in Ireland, and also Cork City Council, which Cork is the second city. And we've been looking at how, how we can reroute traffic uh, because of an accident, because of an incident, first water mains, because of a special event, et cetera. We've been using software product lines to get efficiencies. So looking at how a range of products can be built from a product line. We've also used it to help a company that I cannot name that bids on government contracts. It needs to have those bids be very accurate because if it overprices, it won't get the contract. If it underprices, it won't make any money. The problem is that these contracts require bids that need to be updated and changed because of decisions that are made and using a software product line approach, we've been able to bring that down to a few weeks instead of multiple months. We've been looking at how we can adapt systems for security and privacy. So both with the cloud and in the context of smart buildings, how do we change the security policy of a building because a certain asset is in the building because we have certain visitors, a certain event going on. We've been working with companies like United Technologies in that respect. Um, you may not know United Technologies, but they are the company that owns Otis Elevator, Carrier Air Conditioning, and even Sikorsky Helicopters. We've been looking at how we can parallelize code and evolve code to work on multi-core implementations. So we've worked with a number of companies in this area. One uh, that you probably haven't heard of is Movidius. And you may not hear of Movidius in the future because they've been bought out by Intel, but Mavidius make the uh, display chip that is used in all smartphones. It doesn't matter whether you have a, um, a Samsung or an Apple or whatever, they all use a Mavidius chip. 
And we've been able to take some of their code and automatically evolve it to work on multi-core. So we've been able to create, for example, smart cameras that can identify number plates on cars and do face recognition without the overhead of having to send data back to a centralized resource to do the computation because the multi-core is so powerful and can do it within the camera. And of course, that means we can put cameras in places where we normally wouldn't be able to. And again, we reduce the overhead of data being sent back. We've also been working with a number of companies, particularly in financial services, on architectural recovery and preservation, dealing with the situation of architectural drift because the software has evolved over time and the, the description of the architecture no longer matches the software. So we've been able to understand what the architecture is and prevent too many changes in the architecture. That's not to say we don't allow changes, but at least we know what they are. We've looked at performance evaluation in large scale systems, particularly for the cloud and server farms. We've done this with IBM and we've spun out a really successful company that sold for uh, the Hun area for the last 25 years or so has been autonomous space systems. And this is partly in conjunction with NASA, both while I was the uh, director of the software engineering lab and subsequently, and also as a result of a number of projects we've had with the European Space Agency and projects funded by the European Union in FP7 and Horizon 2020. So my own area of research for almost 25 years has been on building resilient space exploration missions. So these are some of the most complex and expensive software applications to date. I already mentioned Artemis, that the estimates back in the 1990s were for 8 billion US dollars. Who knows what it would be at this stage? These systems tend to have high levels of autonomy, mainly because they're just so difficult to communicate with, and I'll explain that in a few moments. And the consequences for failure are great. NASA missions are typically planned for 25 to 35 years before launch. If they fail, we've lost 25 to 35 years of effort. Uh, many of the people who worked on the projects have long since retired or indeed passed away. The loss of money is great because many of these missions are hundreds of millions of dollars. And we have a bad reputation with the public. And remember, the public are paying for this exploration. And uh, of course, any failure does not look good with the taxpayer. So when I started working with NASA, as I say, around the year 2000, uh, the, um, uh, I had, uh, at that point, swarms were a completely new idea. I know they've become widespread nowadays, but back then they were completely uh, unheard of in computing. So we were looking at how we could be inspired by swarms of bees and colonies of ants and termites and other insects, and indeed flocks of birds not to copy them, not to mimic them, but to be inspired by them and get some ideas. Because while we have some understanding of how flocks of birds work, how colonies of ants and termites leave messages for each other and so on, we're not 100% sure of absolutely everything. And these technologies have been used in a whole range of areas. Uh, in drug discovery, one of my colleagues uh, who works in the area says it's brought drug discovery down in his experience from 17 years on average to about three to four years on average. It's widely used in communication systems uh, such as uh, video on demand, for example, and it's widely used in environmental monitoring. People think of NASA as a space agency, but actually NASA spends more than half its budget monitoring the earth. So environmental monitoring, monitoring includes looking at water, oceans, rivers, uh, lakes, etc., and monitoring the, the status of those. And then of course for exploration and for NASA that means mostly space exploration, but also things like mining and going into harsh environments. The, the swarm the idea of swarms is very useful. So the idea from a space exploration viewpoint is that sending a coordinated swarm of smaller spacecraft gives a number of benefits. Firstly, more effective use of solar power. Solar power is a big issue. Uh, battery power is always a problem and relying on the sun has its limitations in how long things can run for. So smaller devices tend to be more effective. We can do things and go to places that we cannot do with large craft. More importantly, if we send one large spacecraft and it fails, the entire mission is lost. If we send multiple spacecraft, 
then if uh, some of them are damaged or some of them are lost, we may still be able to regroup and continue the mission. We can do more complex tasks. So for example, taking an X-ray requires two devices to be appropriately placed. And that's not possible to do with a single device. So if we have a swarm of smaller devices, that is possible. And of course, that gives us greater flexibility and accuracy. And as I said, resilience, the likelihood of being completely wiped out is reduced. And even if damaged, we might be able to continue with some submission or some smaller part of the mission. I should say that when NASA talks about, so it can be a rover, it can be a rocket, it can be uh, something like the space shuttle, or it can be something as simple as a satellite. It, as long as it goes into space, it's a spacecraft. So we've been working on the autonomous nanotechnology swarm. This is a concept mission. We call it a concept mission because it hasn't launched yet and it has changed dramatically over the years. As I said, the lifetime of the mission is 25 to 35 years in the planning. So you can imagine that uh, the technology changes dramatically over that time, mostly for the better, of course. Um, we are now looking at ANTS launching in 2030, although some um, smaller versions of trials have already been launched. So the idea is to send autonomous spacecraft to explore the surface of the moon and Mars. That's the LARA submission. And the idea is that sending these devices to Mars could collect as much in a day as the rovers have collected in the entire time they've been on Mars in terms of data. Uh, it's also planned to go to the rings of Saturn, that's a submission called SARA, and to the asteroid belt, that's a submission called PAM. That's the more complex, and that's the one I concentrate on in my examples. And the intention, of course, is to put a human on an asteroid, and asteroids have become much more of interest in recent years, particularly as there is one asteroid you've probably heard of, possibly going to threaten the Earth in about 200 years. And um, so it's not a direct worry to us, but it means that asteroids are much more of interest. And scientists believe that by knowing more about how asteroids formed and what asteroids are composed of will give a greater understanding of the origins of the universe. So these are the sort of devices we want to use. Uh, so this is what we call a tech walker. And so each of the nodes is a computer and transfer of the control from one node to the other makes the device fall over. And so the intention is that this can go over rocks and craters and rough surfaces. And we can connect multiple of these together to give essentially a caterpillar that would be able to carry a payload and carry devices. Of course, that's an animation, but just to let you see the real thing. So this particular device can shrink down to be a 30 centimeter cube, and it can expand out to be two meters tall, and it can climb the outside of a five-story building. We also have a, a fake Martian surface that it's filed on, and it's quite capable of going over craters and rocks. So the PAM submission of ANTS involves sending one large spacecraft to L1. L1 is the Earth-Moon Lagrangian point. So it's a point in space where there's negligible effect on small enough bodies in terms of gravity. So from there, a thousand spacecraft would be launched and pulled solely by gravity out to the asteroid belt. Takes them. They form themselves in subgroups, which collect various types of data. So each of the spacecraft is the same, except they carry different devices. So the basic structure is the same, but they carry devices like cameras, magnetoscopes, X-ray devices, etc. They work together to identify asteroids that are of interest and then go and collect data and send it back to Earth. Why do we send so many spacecraft? Well, we expect to lose 60 to 70 percent of them from collisions, both with themselves and with asteroids. If they're damaged, obviously they're not going to be able to collect data anymore, but we can use them as messengers. So basically we have them reprogram themselves so that they take on a new role. 
and the day they sent back to Earth. And you'll see arrow five is a unidirectional arrow. Data sent to Earth, there's no control from Earth. And the reason for that is that this mission has to be self-managing in space. It is so far from Earth that we can't possibly send instructions to it. It's not that we can't send instructions, but that the round trip delay is so great. So if one of these spacecraft were able to send a message to Earth saying, I'm about to have a collision, even if Earth could give it the necessary instructions immediately with no delay and send them back, there would be a 40 minute delay in that process. So the entire mission would be lost by the time Earth could possibly send any information back. So this is obviously something that has to run by itself in a harsh environment. It has to be self-managing. The software has to be able to evolve. It has to change itself based on the scenario. And I have a video here, it's quite long. So I'm not going to play all of it, but I'll just play a little bit of it to give you an idea of what this mission is about. This reconfigurable technology, or SMART, will contain all 1,000 one kilogram spacecraft. This SMART cube will be delivered to the Earth Moon L1 Lagrange point for deployment. Each spacecraft will be released in sequence from the SMART Cube. The self-deployment of each spacecraft from its SMART shell will be the reverse of the manufacturing scenario. After deployment, the recyclable SMART shell will reconfigure into a stackable and reusable rectangle for return. Carbon nanotubule tethers will be deployed from multifaceted MEMS nodes to form the frame for the sail. The lengthening shortening process is completely reversible and the nodes are flexible. Thus, the frame is extensively shapeable. A smart instrument and subsystem holding platform, similar in design to the space frame, will be reconfigurably tethered to the frame. The sails will reversibly deploy over the frame from specially designed MEMS nodes. Sail and frame are changeable in shape and extent and are capable of forming tip vanes, making holes, and stowing sails as needed to assist in navigation and data collection. There are 10 classes of spacecraft specialists, identical except for their specialties, including eight instrument classes or workers, plus communication specialists called messengers, and processing specialists called leaders. Subswarms will form and depart as groups of 100 spacecraft become available, with 10 from each specialist class. Over a period of two and a half years, the swarm will travel on a solar sailing trajectory toward the asteroid belt. In each subswarm, imagers will perform remote detection of asteroids. Based on imager input and mission goals, leaders will select optimal targets. Each subswarm then navigates to its assigned target. Imagers collect data for a 3D model from stereo imaging, with possible inputs from other worker classes for further details near the target.
Once the 3D model is adequate, clusters of workers of the same class move to optimal configurations for their data gathering operations. When leaders determine that the target has been adequately surveyed, data taking operations cease, survey knowledge is shared, and a messenger is selected to return the data to Earth. So uh, the, uh, the first time I played this video in public was at a space conference and I was the first speaker. And when I finished, somebody at the back of the room stood up and said, I'm glad to see we're starting this conference with science fiction. But this is not science fiction. All of this technology does exist. Uh, we need to make it better. We need to make it more efficient. Of course, over a 25 to 35 year planning cycle, a lot of the details will change. A lot of the implementation will change. But the technology does exist. Other versions of this in, uh, in less ambitious scales have already been uh, in use. So we're contributing in, in four areas from the software aspect. And this is a, obviously a, a mission that involves many hundreds of researchers, but we're working on the software aspects. So we're working with formal methods, autonomic computing, software product lines, and automatic code generation. And I'll just talk briefly about what we're doing in each of these. So we've had a project called FAST, Formal Approaches to Swarm Technologies, that has looked at what way would you need to specify the various components and activities and actions in such a mission. So we've essentially the CSP to CCS, to X machines, to probabilistic versions, all sorts of aspects have to be addressed and no one notation is going to do all of that. Some notations give us multiple viewpoints, which of course is useful, but no single notation is going to do everything. Emil Vassev, one of my former postdocs, developed a language called Autonomic System Specification Language, or ASSL. And the idea of ASSL is that it has primitives built in for making decisions, for understanding the circumstances in which it, which it finds itself. And the big advantage of ASSL is that it's a formal notation, so we can reason about it, but it also generates code in Java. Now, NASA doesn't use Java for flight, so that code is not going to be used in a mission, but it means that we actually have implemented code, uh, we have something we can use for simulation, etc. We've been working with concepts from autonomic computing. Uh, again, here we're taking inspiration from the human body or the mammalian body. Nervous system is fight or flight. It's concerned with the immediate and short-term protection of the body. So the simple example is if you touch something hot, you automatically pull back your hand. You don't even have to think about it. It's what your body does to protect itself. Then the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest. It's concerned with the policies and regulation of the body so that over time it's maintained itself. So we have to sleep, we have to get food. Our body tells us that in various ways, and we have to do it. So we've been able to build up an autonomic environment. So each of these components are what we call, call autonomic elements. They consist of a managed component, which is the, the real worker, if you like, and an autonomic manager that looks at them. And so what, it, what we can do is we can create an I am alive signal, which is like a heartbeat, and that's something that is done commonly in embedded systems. And to this, we can add the equivalent of a pulse beat that tells us something about the health of the system based on the strength or speed of the signal that it's sending. And uh, in fact, uh, this is something that NASA has been using for about 50 years, but they didn't call it a pulse beat, they call it beacon monitoring. So the idea that you send different types of signals back to indicate whether a system is working the way it should, or if it has issues or what kind of issues. We can put components into sleep mode if they're not working well. And in the case of the ANTS mission, we have components that will be damaged. 
we have components that may not be operating well because of a collision. We don't want them to disrupt the mission, so we can put them into a sleep mode. We also have to put components into a sleep mode when there's a solar storm. The sun is a star, like all stars, it has stardust, which sounds romantic, but in fact, stardust is space junk. And the sun ejects this when there's a storm. It also ejects radiation. So we have to put components into a sleep mode so that they're protected. And when the storm passes, they can come back out of that sleep mode. We can tell them to wake up again. Luckily, we get about 24 hours notice for a solar storm. And then lastly, we can develop what we call an ALICE signal or an autonomic license between components that can trust each other and can work well together and know that the other component can be relied upon, both in terms of doing what it's supposed to do and not doing something it's not supposed to do and not having to compromise in any way. So we've been looking at uh, software product lines for building this kind of system. Essentially the same sort of components are going to be used on the surface of Mars and the moon flying through the rings of Saturn and flying through the asteroid belt. The same basic technology will be there, but they'll have to do different things and they'll have different problems. So here we see in red, the self-protection during a solar storm is something that will be encountered in the PAN submission, but that will not be an issue when we go to the rings of Saturn. So there'll be a different self-protection mechanism for problems with the gases in the rings. So we can swap in and out that self-protection mechanism, but still use the same basic components and the same basic software. And we want to do automatic code generation. We develop a patented novel approach that has been licensed to a code generation tool maker and generate code. So in the past, those scenarios would have been expressed in actual language. Nowadays, it might be UML or some other notation. To us, it doesn't really matter as long as we can parse it. So we want to generate models from which we can generate code. And we can, of course, extract models from existing code. And using the mathematical laws of concurrency, we can reverse these. And we do that with the aid of a theorem prover and basically end up with a round trip development method. So we can go from requirements to models to code and back again and be guaranteed of the correspondence between them. So we've built a tool, as I say, using a theorem prover, prover, and the notation we've been using is CSP. This is a bias because of our own expertise and backgrounds. And there are multiple other notations and multiple other theorem provers that can be used just as effectively. So this method gives us an entire development process that's automated, much higher quality, the ability to do formal proof about properties, and proof of correctness. And we can do a sort of an automated requirements analysis a sort of what if uh, by changing components. And we have a guaranteed correspondence between the requirements and the actual implementation as code. So we've used this for end-to-end -end code generation, uh, automatic re-implementation after requirements changes. And again, in a 25 to 35 year cycle, we're going to have many changing requirements. Uh, reuse cross platforms, People forget that NASA does not use standard chips. Most chips that NASA uses are bespoke to be low power and low weight. And these change over time. So we want to be able to reuse the same software on multiple platforms and different types of chips. We want to be able to reverse engineer some legacy systems. As I told you, NASA's oldest software is more than 50 years old. And a lot of its software is quite old. We can document some existing systems for which there's little or no documentation. And we can re-engineer some older systems into a newer platform and using newer technologies. So, so far we've used this on a number of agent-based systems, particularly for uh, lights out control of satellite systems. We've used it in wireless sensor networks. And you can actually consider ANTS to be a wireless sensor networks on steroids, as I call it, because essentially it is a wireless sensor network, just instead of simple sensors, we have far more complex computing devices. And of course, it is far from Earth, which makes issues much more significant. And we've used this technology to verify the robotic procedures in um, updating and servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble, as you possibly know, was originally uh, built uh, to be launched and brought down every five years or so for upgrades. It was designed 
that it would fit in the cargo bay of the space shuttle, or in fact, the space shuttle was designed that its cargo bay fit Hubble. Uh, unfortunately, after its first launch, there was a problem with the folding solar panels, which had to be replaced. And as a result, the Hubble could never come down. In the future, it would be replaced with JWST in the near future uh, with JWST, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. These are the uh, requirements for the servicing of the Hubble, or rather the instructions for the servicing of the Hubble, which was originally to be done with a robot arm and on its own. Eventually, it was used by a robot arm and done by a robot arm and uh, astronauts. So this is the set of instructions. The first column corresponds to timing constraints. The next column is the grapple arm, which is the large robot arm. And then the next two are the dexterous uh, arms, which were in the, originally to be the smaller robot arms and subsequently astronauts. This may look very like a Word document because it is. It's about 5,000 pages of a Word document. Uh, the the 5,000 pages had to be recomputed when the servicing mission started because the exact launch would not be known. There are requirements that at certain points, the battery, of course, had to be recharged. So nothing critical could be done while the battery was being recharged. And there were periods of approximately nine minutes, uh, sorry, 11 minutes every 90 minutes where we could not see what was happening. And as a result, nothing critical could be done at that point either. These outage times were not known until the mission started. So this 5,000 pages had to be recomputed. The big advantage of a Word document is that you can tag it. And once we can tag it, we can feed it into our tool. And so, so here we have our tool called R2D2C, taking a small fragment of these instructions, turning them into CSPM, which is a machine readable version of CSP, and then executing it in Java. And our problem here was that we kept getting a problem after just a few seconds. We figured this was because this was a prototype tool and, and the next version would get around that. As it turned out, there was an error on the very first line of these 5,000 pages. Of course, this would have been caught by various other mechanisms of, of verification and, and for quality control, but it was very satisfying to us that we could find something so quickly uh, that obviously validated our use of this tool. So this technology and technology similar to it will be used in the Artemis mission, as I said, the most expensive software mission mission test, uh, or sorry, I should say the most expensive software project ever conceived. Um, and of course, we look forward to that actual launch and to its use in going to the moon and ultimately to Mars. So as I say, software must evolve. It has a role to play in all sorts of areas, everything from our daily lives to space exploration. But the point is that the advantage of software is that it can be changed and it has to change. There will always be a attention, a trade-off between the reliability that we need and the predictability and costs that we're willing to enter into and be careful and can certainly increase our costs. So there is a need for this evolving critical systems research effort that I've described and Leo, our research that effort. So uh, just a word of Warning, not everything scales up. So again, 25 to 35 year missions change dramatically over time. New technology comes along. The underlying principles are probably the same. The goals are certainly the same, but they may vary somewhat. And just because we can do something beautifully on paper, it doesn't necessarily follow that it scales up to the large scale real life projects that we have in mind. So I'll leave you with a quote from David Wheeler. David Wheeler worked on EDSAC, the computer I showed you at the beginning. He was also the first person to ever get a PhD in computer science. So I'm not saying that people hadn't gotten PhDs related to computers before that, but they were PhDs in engineering or PhDs in mathematics. He got a PhD in computer science. And he also invented what was then known as the Wheeler jump. And nowadays we call it a subroutine. And he said that any problem in computer science can be solved with another layer of indirection, but that will usually create another problem and possibly those problems are not so easily solved. So thank you very much. Again, thank you for your attention. 
and for your invitation to join you today. And sorry for the small problem with the technology at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for whether we have a question. Uh, okay, the uh, attendees can ask their question via the chat. Uh, I want to ask you a simple uh, issue uh, uh, about. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, you talk about the wireless sensor networks. You are talking about software in a very complicated systems and uh, how you can use uh, the wireless sensor networks in this system and how much uh, are they uh, critical in these systems or, um, you know, uh, because because the wireless sensors are generally uh, very has very low computation capacity, so uh, you need to care uh, some different uh, some lightweight protocols, some some different uh, software issues. So, uh, how can you deal with uh, these wireless sensors? Let me say just one. Uh, for example, uh, I work on wireless sensor networks, and it is a general say that for two decades uh, they generally try to be. I try to have simpler, simpler and uh, cheaper uh, sensors. So think about people try to reduce their size and you uh, you need to make great computation. Uh, so I really wonder uh, how you uh, use them. Well, I mean, obviously, as you say, In this a, lot, mm -hmm. a lot of the goal is to, to move towards smaller and simpler sensors that use less batteries can go in more uh, more complicated places, places where they're not necessarily seen, not necessarily obvious, not, not detracting from people's view, uh, et cetera. So yes, there is a move towards having much more simpler sensors, but there's also a move to having much more complex and useful sensors. So mm -hmm. in, in space exploration, obviously sending something trivial that cannot really do much is except collect very simple data is not of great use when you're talking about having descended so far and to survive for such a long period of time. And indeed, I've come across examples where people are encouraging the use of mobile phones instead of wireless sensors. So I came across a very interesting example of a bridge in India, in Calcutta, where people were being given free data or some of their data free to encourage them to use an app. And the app was collecting data about the status of the bridge on people's personal mobile phones as they crossed over and back on the bridge, this meant they didn't have to put in sensors, they didn't have to worry about batteries, they didn't have to worry about maintaining the sensors, and they had a regular traffic over and forward on the bridge. I think this is a brilliant idea, but here is something that is far more complex, and what you want to do with it is probably going to get more and more complex, and more and more functionality can be added to that app, that app can be updated, the updates can be sent to people's phones, of course they may have to accept to download the update, but it means that we can do a lot more complex things. So yes, there, there'll be a market for much, much more simple wireless sensor networks. But if you have a very simple device collecting very simple data and using very little power, you've got to send that back somewhere to be processed. And it's in the processing that you're going to have this evolving software and the need for liability. So I think it's a matter of whether you're putting the functionality out there to the devices or whether you're putting the functionality at a centralized point. And there's an argument for both, of course, depending on what you're doing. Think of the example I mentioned to you about the camera. We could, we could develop a camera, and we have developed a camera that can identify number plates on cars in the camera. There's no need to send back pictures to a centralized place to look these up in the database. We can actually tell what the number is and identify it. So there's a big advantage to being able to put the functionality out into the device there are other places where the device has to be very low power, very simple, et cetera. That's just not the sort of applications that we happen to be working in, but obviously that exists too. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. And yeah. I, I have another question uh, about uh, the autonomous systems. So you talk about autonomous systems and robotic systems. So uh, when you consider the robotic system with wireless sensor networks, uh, the uh, result will be uh, great generally. Uh, wireless sensor network and robotics uh, are uh, have been worked uh, for two, three decades uh, separately. But in the last decade, the people say that okay, let's uh, use them, uh, and uh, uh, the result is uh, much better than uh, working them separately. And uh, when you consider them in the uh, complex system, in the space system, uh, 
uh, the as I see, the data is uh, critical, especially in some application. Uh, you have some critical uh, application. And mm -hmm. uh, how do you consider uh, the security issues in this data? Because you are uh, handling crit uh, critical data, but uh, you know uh, there is a cyber security issues and have you considered for example uh, blockchain or some other distributed solutions about that or uh, one more thing for example people talk about the blockchain mm -hmm. but uh, do you have scalable uh, lightweight uh, appropriate uh, solution for your uh, system because okay. we should also consider the computational uh, side Indeed. of the uh, Protocols. Absolutely. I mean, blockchain is computationally very expensive, very heavy. And NASA, of course, does have large scale computers on the Earth that it can use, but it doesn't have those in space. And the likelihood of them being in space anytime soon, unless quantum computing really pays off, it's not going to happen. Right. So the amount of energy alone that's needed for blockchain is prohibitive. And um, we don't have that in space. So it ha would have to be done yeah. on Earth. Well, for the proof of work, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, but the data that we're collecting is not necessarily critical in that sense, in the sense of security critical. Yes, we want to collect useful and correct data, but it's not likely to be corrupted. It's not likely to be hacked. And uh, mm -hmm. there are very few, um, this sort of mission, there are very few people, and by people, I mean mostly governments who could hack into such a system, who would have the, the, the necessary equipment to be able to send messages to these devices. But that's why we have this autonomic license that I, I just mentioned very quickly. The idea is that the components know which components they can trust. And if there's any reason why a component could not be trusted, that license is canceled, so that component is not dealt with, or that component is put into sleep mode. And of course, if it fails to go into sleep mode, which means it has been corrupted in some, in, whether maliciously or not, then the license is withdrawn. So we have built in some security mechanisms. Of course, there will be more security mechanisms. Blockchain is a very good question. The problem, I mean, of course it has an application, but the problem is the computational power and the energy power that's needed, um, which is just not available in space. And by the time you send everything back to be done on earth and sent back, it's just not practical at that distance, perhaps for some nearer to earth missions, but certainly not for something that far out. Um, uh, I, I have submitted a uh, project for MIT Seoul Social Entrepreneurship uh, uh -huh. contest, uh, and uh, in that uh, contest, for example, I don't con uh, I consider uh, the classical data collection from the sensors, for example, a robot collects data from the sensors uh -huh. because you know uh, they uh, they sold it, but. Uh, in my solution, I have uh, I had three tires. The first one is the robot to sensor, uh, and the last tire is UAV to robot. But at the middle tire, at the second tire, I consider the robotic networks. And uh, I think that uh, you know when you consider uh, robotic swarms, uh, you know uh, people in general try to make them uh, distributed, uh, decentralized. And uh, for example. Uh, uh, there is a uh, thing that in the robotic network, there is a cluster head, the cluster head collects data and uh, assign the task uh, task to other robots to execute. It may be military mm -hmm. operation and space exploration. And um, think about because any reason, because the reason, it may be a energy, uh, you know, a lack of energy. It may be because of low performance, because sometimes the ro mm -hmm. uh, robotic head can evaluate themselves and say that, okay, uh, I don't, uh, uh, I couldn't give a good uh, decision. So uh, after then, uh, the cluster head robot, uh, the robot head may uh, try to leave uh, the position, uh, the head uh, role to another robot. And in this case, in this case, uh, I think there's a, a critical question which uh, differs the robotic network to classical various sensor networks. Well, the sensor networks just give the classical measurement, but the head robot uh, call, uh, head has a, a know-how. What is know-how? For example, uh, after assign task to robot, it collects data and evaluates the result and gives some decision and uh, has the, uh, you know, keep the memory the data and it should also transfer, it uh, need to transfer those know-how to the new uh, 
e, cluster head robot. So instead of instead of this requirement, I think that maybe considering a distributed ledger, it may be not uh, the uh, most secure uh, distributed ledger, but maybe considering a distributed ledger uh, is a good solution uh, or maybe better solution because if uh, the cluster head robot may be damaged uh, physically or some other per, uh, because of some other reason, any one of the other can continue. And after they elect to elect it as cluster head, they don't need to uh, wait for the uh, know-how. That is uh, why I also consider uh, a kind of uh, lightweight blockchain for that purpose. Yeah. Not the classical proof of work, because for the, you know, the proof of work is uh, yeah. very complicated, but maybe proof of stake or some other kind yeah. of uh, consensus protocol uh, may help this issue. That, that is uh, yeah. just my idea. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. if I uh, we, we, say we, it we... Uh, very, very long. <laughs> no. I'm sorry about that. No, no we, 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 do, we, do have a, we do have something like that in, in, built in. Yes, we don't call it a distributed ledger, but essentially that's what it is. Yeah, um, and and uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of agent technology that's used in doing this, so that you have so that in the swarm, as you say, that that information is available. Yes, you're right. I mean, if one component is damaged and it contains all the information, you can't send it to somebody else because it's damaged, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's damaged beyond repair or not is a different matter. And of course, in space, it really is beyond repair. And um, so yes, so again, that's part of the the autonomic license understanding which components are working correctly. If the, the component that's acting as the, the, the subswarm ruler or leader, whichever we want to call it, um, isn't responding, isn't able to provide the information. Yes, it could be sent from Earth, but as I say, it, because it's so long, it's, it's quite slow to do that. Uh, certainly for immediate responses, that's not possible. But in the long term, you can send software updates or data updates from Earth. So it's not impossible to send information from Earth just that it's not practical to have the day-to-day the -day management from Earth. Um, but yes, there is a concept whereby the, the knowledge is shared amongst the swarm and that it is available, yes. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, it, it is equivalent to a distributed ledger um, or a lightweight blockchain as you, as you call it, but yeah, we, it isn't blockchain per se, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not necessarily blockchain. For example, at least, for example, if you wanted to share the data to uh, all of the other users, all of the other people, we use at least uh, WhatsApp. Uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> broadcast have, technology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I say that in zero security because uh, uh, totally transparency. But yeah. uh, when we consider the blockchain, not only the security, but also I uh, want to imply the uh, transparency is right. Uh, yeah. Side because uh, you know uh, it really uh, you know uh, make me confused when I start to work on robotic biosensor networks. Uh, I I some publication and uh, publish a PhD thesis on that. Uh, so that, that is uh, why I ask especially that, that question yeah. about, about that. Uh, and uh, th thank you very much for, for this great uh, webinar. And I'm looking whether we have any other uh, questions. Uh, okay, and I am just uh, Ali. Could you uh, could you see any question on the Facebook? I can't have issue. Just It's more okay. Just uh, I checked the Facebook and it seems uh, there is no more question. Okay, <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you very much for this uh, great webinar. And uh, we are very uh, honored to uh, host you uh, such a great speaker 